Memphis Wrestling, which can be argued is probably some of the most influential pro wrestling in all of pro wrestling. <laughs> so Wayne, yep. uh, so when we saw Tales from the Territories and the first episode, boom, right out of the gate was Memphis Wrestling. And they had Dutch Mantel, Jerry the King Lawler, uh, Jerry Jarrett, Jeff Jarrett, like right out of the gate. I was like, whoa, like they are just... And the Mouth of the South, Jimmy oh, Hart. Oh, yes, and they had Mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart, too. So how accurate would you say, you know, you grew up watching Memphis Wrestling, right? I did. So how accurate would you say that this was? I mean, it, the you know, the boys tend to, you know, I once caught a fish this big. But a lot of this was pretty accurate of saying, like, where the pro wrestling was real. I, it was. I, they, you know, way before there was extreme pro wrestling, they were doing that. Uh, strap matches, coal miner glove matches, uh, scaffold matches, you know, first to bleed matches. They, they did it all. Everything. Brawling in the stands, brawling in the, in the, you know, in the concession area. It was, it, they they brawled everywhere. Their angles ranged in. I remember Jimmy Valiant jumping Jerry Lawler when Lawler was doing a concert. He literally <laughs> put out an album in the 70s, and he was doing a concert, and Valiant came out at the end, jumped him, and busted his guitar over his head. <laughs> yeah, that's unreal, uh, because that Valiant, was even uh, at a wrestling show, right? That was a separate concert That was event. a totally... Jerry Lawler was the king of Memphis, and not just in wrestling. Uh, Jerry Lawler actually retaliated. He jumped Jimmy Valiant at the airport and <laughs> broke his leg at the airport. <laughs> Can you imagine some, trying to run an angle now at the airport where you're trying to break someone's leg? What the, what oh the airport, airport well, security would swarm you? <laughs> Well, the you know the problem uh, the, that they they alluded to on the show is they drew such a huge share over a seventy percent share. That's so unreal. seven in ten households watched Saturday morning wrestling, and I remember we owned a, a we lived in a little town called Blyville, Arkansas, uh, about an hour, hour and a half, two hours out of uh, Memphis. I was little, so I don't know exactly how long. <laughs> anyway. The uh, we owned a restaurant and people would come in and all they would talk about was wrestling. <laughs> the day, the day, you know, we were on the tour stop and when somebody would come in, uh, the day of the show, they would start saying, "Oh, I hope Lawler throws this fire. Oh, I hope he throws fire tonight." <laughs> and sure enough, the fire would come out and he'd throw a flash, uh, uh, you know, fire right in someone's face. And that's all that night and into Saturday morning they would be talking. And, of course, the restaurant cleared out when wrestling came on TV. They They're right not kidding. Businesses shut down. What was it Jimmy Hart said? Uh, 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 farmers got off their tractors, <laughs> yeah. which is a famous line that comes from uh, Mr. Jeff Gretler. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry. Uh, I owe an apology to the FCC circa 1994 yes. East Texas. <laughs> Yes. Jeff was sitting in the radio booth and he went off and he said, get down off your John Deere tractor and scrape the pig shit off your boot. <laughs> and the, the, the guy that was on, on duty come running down the hall. He can't say that. Stop him. Stop him. And of course, Jeff had locked the door and he couldn't get in. <laughs> I was like, this is good, right? This is good stuff. <laughs> Trying to get tickets, man. <laughs> you, shot, you did a Shawshank Redemption on it. <laughs> did the old sitting back like Andy. Yeah. Jeff just enjoyed what he just said. <laughs> <laughs> and to make matters worse, this was in deep East Texas, yeah. but, you know, Texas's Bible Belt. And the, the club that we were running that afternoon, the owner looked at the promoter and he had a bad stutter. And he goes, did, did he say what I think he said? <laughs> and, and Rusty just put his head down like, oh, my God, yes. And he goes, well, they're going to find me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the 90s. It was such a lawless time. <laughs> but it was good stuff. But, but, you know, like you said, a lot of, you know, especially that, uh, you know, East Texas had a little bit of that, too. Uh, what Memphis had is <laughs> it was it was somewhat of a shoot, right? Like, even though Kayfabe was already out of the bag, they 
they still were into it and shoot, but not as much as it was in the 70s. I mean, Lawler's story about that fan waiting for him outside with that brick, and he got that brand new car, and he's like, if you throw that brick, I'm going to run you over. (laughs) And the guy still threw it anyway, and I guess the car not going in there basically stopped Lawler from hitting this guy with a car, which ironically, they ran that angle with Eddie Gilbert, who went too fast and hit Lawler with a car. And the same thing basically happened because that you that was not worked. He he hit him with the car. Yes, he did. And that yes, was Yes, he did. And that freaked out all of Memphis. The whole territory, because they covered Arkansas, uh, Mississippi, uh, Kentucky. The that the whole territory lit up. And and people were actually were calling in and calling the police and wanted Gilbert arrested for attempted murder. Oh man, yeah, and that was a bad hit. R.I.P. to Eddie Gilbert. You know, Mario, I don't know if you know this. My first match was against Wayne. My second match was against Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert. You did tell me about that. Yeah, yeah. who beat me down with a cane. So when he, I'm going to work, this legend, you know, and if he would have if he wouldn't have passed away earlier, I think he would have been a big part of the business, but. That was one of the main things that I thought of because we grew up on WWF. We didn't get a lot of this stuff, but there would be a pro wrestling illustrated show or something in the magazines with Joe Pettacino or Bill Apter. And I remember it's like, this is the guy that ran over Jerry the King Lawler with the car because that hit was bad. And then Lawler almost had to reenact that in real life with the guy who threw the brick. Uh, Wayne, what about, do you, like a lot of these stories, I don't know if you remembered uh, watching him on the air. What about the story of that guy who had the blow dart and hit the blow dart in Jimmy Jimmy Hart's ass? That was funny. I laughed when I saw that, and then it then I got to thinking, "Holy cow, man! How dangerous is that?" <laughs> it could have been anything on that and, dart. And, you can and put you anything know, on my, a dart for my, sure. You know my germaphobic ass. If someone had shot me, I'd have been down at the the uh, emergency room screaming, "I have AIDS! I have Hep C! I have!" I, I would have been freaked out about that, you know. Yeah, and dude, he's so. How does that idea even get in someone's head that I'm going to shoot a blow dart at a wrestler? You know, it's like, oh, I'm going to hit him. He's such a jerk. But it's like, no, I'm, I'm going to order a blow dart gun off of the back of a comic. That was that one was homemade, and that was uh, uh, that's hillbilly country up there. It's not a, a stereotype, and that's uh, how they take down squirrels with blow darts. Sure, <laughs> shoot Those a blow. Are, absolutely, they shoot blow darts at squirrels. <laughs> you better believe. You better believe there's there's some crazy stuff goes up in those Ozarks and wow. around Tennessee. You'd have to be pretty. Squirrels are fast. Yeah, I don't think you can catch them with a blow dart. <laughs> well, he, uh, he, he got they you. stop sooner or later. <laughs> oh my goodness! I if Jimmy, if I was Jimmy Hart, I would have freaked out. And of course, the the funny thing to me is he was worried about his pay. Like, oh, I don't, I don't want to go have to pay for a tetanus shot. <laughs> I'm like, that's what you're worried about? Your pay? <laughs> and I love the idea of they basically had the cops and the building security that had pro wrestling justice back then. Well, if you, if you started a fight, kind of like if you were do work cheating a casino, they brought you to the back and let the wrestlers work you over. And that story of Jimmy Hart's like, so they brought him back. He's like, we caught him. Do you want to? Do you want to lump him up a little? He's like, no, I'm okay. Because <laughs> he's like, this guy's way bigger than me. I'm not going to be able to do anything to him. But they would literally bring uh, these people back and let the wrestlers take shots at him. That's, oh yeah, that's lawless. Yeah. That's crazy. I I heard a few veterans. I heard a few veterans tell stories about that, where the cops would would take them to the back. And but that's a good deterrent. I saw a match right there in my hometown there you know, uh, Blyville, Arkansas, I watched a match. It was uh, uh, Eddie Gilbert and Tommy Gilbert versus Kurt Hennig and Larry the Axe Hennig, father and son tag teams taking each other uh, on. And a guy got upset and uh, jumped up on the ring apron, and Eddie Gilbert flew over there and hit him, and blood went everywhere the guy flew off the the ring apron and landed on the first row of chairs and the cops come and took him out and 
I, I was a little kid, and I was thinking to myself, oh, my God, he got so mad. He just, he don't even get to see the main event. <laughs> but the cops thought he had he got enough, I guess, because as soon as that match was over, they let him go back to his seat. So, <laughs> Can you imagine in 2022 at an AEW show that somebody like taps, like takes a swing at a wrestler and they pull him out of the crowd, bring him to the back, let the wrestlers lump him up, and then they send him back to their seat? And that would... <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that would that would be a huge scandal. That It'd would be, be a, a huge scandal. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, the whole world is freaking out over a couple little pushing matches between the wrestlers in the back now. So right, yeah, that was big. You know, that probably was a was more of a pushing match than anything. We know that it's going to be tough to get any shots in before you take it to the ground. There was like no hits, and that was even more tame than the generation before. With the story of Jerry Jarrett, and you had that one promoter's like, oh, this guy's trying to take my job. Tries to go into business for himself, runs in the ring, and Jerry Jarrett's like, this guy may kill me. I got to take him out. And he ripped his eyeball out. <laughs> yes. Like, what? Can you imagine right now? It's like, yeah, I'm, when I'm, I saw that part, I was like, he really ripped his eyeball out? That was like, a really good that, figure of speech. No. Yeah. Well, we've no, always heard the story of not. like Haku, you know, getting in the barroom brawls and they go for your eyes, right? That's what the old school wrestlers yes. like. We're gonna, we're not looking to best you in a, just like a machismo contest. We're looking to com- basically incapacitate you so where no one gets hurt. Can you imagine well, if you Tony? Also Con- have to remember, <laughs> you also have to remember Mario. In those days, the the time that the period that you're talking about. If a wrestler lost a barroom brawl, I don't care who he was. I don't care if he's the the champion of the territory. I don't care. He's done. Like, he is blacklisted and out. Yeah. So, if you put 10 years into the business and finally got to the main event and you're finally getting main event pay, it's over. And so, you can't lose a barroom fight. You just can't. Don't care how big the guy is. There's no excuses. You had to win. So if you had to go for his eyes, you had to go for his throat. It didn't matter. Yeah. And, and actually, I don't know if if uh, our trainer, Tugboat Taylor, told you, but Tug put his thumbs in the corner of my eye, and he said, right here, if you put a little pressure right here, go in, you feel the, the cord pull out. <laughs> so, oh, our own yeah. trainer taught me. Yeah, he taught, he taught me the ears. To this day, I still taught when I'm doing a – when I'm training people in kickboxing, I, I explain to them the the tug story of just like how e- no, I think this was Sputnik. How easy it is to remove somebody's ear. Like there's just like oh that's I, I, that's just a little. I did bit not of hear that one. It was like that's just a little bit of cartilage. If you grab that, it'll come right off. <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm teaching combos, I'm like you just grab that ear. Like if it's. Combos are nice for exercise, but if this is a self defense, like as you're hitting them, grab an ear, yeah, <laughs> and just pull. Just reservoir dog that yeah. ear. <laughs> but so Wayne, I was going to ask you what I was really curious about. So there was a second episode, right? And we it got into Andy Kaufman, who oh, I haven't seen the second episode. It's out. Yeah, it is out, and it's all about Andy Kaufman, which it, we talked about this. We we've done a whole podcast and show about Andy Kaufman. I'm from Hollywood. He just got it. And, you know, he got it and he went to probably the best place he could go because WWE wasn't, you know, F at the time wasn't interested to have somebody who loved working people. He loved living the gimmick. Uh, is there any stories yeah. Wayne, that you can talk about? Like, do you remember specifically for with Andy Kaufman? Yes, actually, that was a very interesting episode. There were there's some little details in there that I didn't know about how they handled him, how how hard it was to deal with him at times. Although he had extreme love and respect for the business, his kind of mania and staying in character got out of hand with him a little bit. In fact, Jimmy Hart had to kind of be his handler slash uh, babysitter. And uh, it it was an excellent episode. And one thing that just stuck stuck out to me is how much respect everyone involved that was there had for for Andy Kaufman, how much he loved the business. And they covered what you're talking about, that he that he approached uh, WWE, and Vince McMahon Sr. turned him back and said that he wasn't sure 
he wanted to have a Hollywood actor around the wrestling threatening the 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 cafe yeah. status of the WWE. But of course the the Memphis territory was a little bit more wild, a little bit more crazy. And so they took him right in and the rest is history. It was one of the best angles ever executed in wrestling and a lot of that is the dedication of Andy Kaufman. He he sold it unbelievable. He he uh he took that pal driver and he demanded an ambulance come. He paid <laughs> to that stay story. in a hospital for three straight days and he <laughs> was working. He was working the doctors and nurses. It, it was it was amazing. I love uh, people, that idea of the referee going back and forth and he's like going to Jerry Lawrence like and he says he wants an ambulance. Tell him no, it's too expensive. And then go back and, and he said he said he'll pay for it. Okay, let's get an ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> that that is wrestling in a nutshell right there because in those days the money was everything yeah that's that's why you hear when you see those old shoot videos the legends always talk about doing business yeah you got you got to do business you got to sell it you got to do business smart business and, you know and something real quick that i want to throw in before we move too fast that well, you said earlier about uh them talking about wrestling and memphis being real it looked real they they were working everything and everybody worked very light in memphis except of course some of the the extreme chair shots and stuff like that although wrestlers in memphis put their hands up none of this stuff that they have today where you don't have any guts if you put your hands up it still looked devastating and the fans still bought it and one of the best quotes that i've ever heard about then versus now Jerry Lawler said, not in the show, I, I saw him in a separate interview, but he said, it's ironic that in the old days, we barely touched each other and everybody thought it was real. Nowadays, they knock the living hell out of each other and everybody thinks it's fake. Yeah. Man, here, here. That was, I, lo I love that quote. Coming from a wrestling legend who knew how to work and got elbows that were so stiff that basically jarred his heart out of rhythm and caused a heart attack live meanwhile this is coming from the guy like that had a match with you know i'm from hollywood comedian barely touched each other and had people clamoring from the rooftops and wait like there was hardly any contact in that original match no yes yes like they sold the although oh, although that that suplex on the back of a Kaufman's head looked nasty to oh, me. Oh, it did, man. It really did. That was like three moves, right? He gave him a soup, uh, the belly to back, uh, a, a vertical suplex, and a pile driver, right? That was it. Three why moves. was it so nasty? Did, did Andy driver. know how to take that bump, or why did it look so bad? I think he was just so uh, light. Well, he Lawler ragged kinda, on him, right? Yeah, he kind of fell backwards instead of dropping him straight down, and Andy didn't know how to really tuck his chin and kick and and keep his momentum where it would land on his shoulders and back unreal and and but people but, it were people were frothing an angle that took for years they made money off that angle and it leaked into oh. the mainstream right they're like oh we got to get you know get him off snl he's just too into this wrestling stuff where now you know there's a somebody wrote a great article it's like just admit it you're a fan of pro wrestling because we see the influences all over all over sports oh, What's wild is yeah, that if you I, watch I that uh, of, if you watch that I'm from Hollywood documentary where they talk about that whole Memphis wrestling thing, um, <laughs> like they they interview like other celebrities at the beginning of the documentary, and it's like Tony Danza and Robin <laughs> Williams, and they're like, yeah, Andy really had a problem. <laughs> yeah, like he was wearing his wrestling gear under his regular clothes. <laughs> I think he needed help. And they do like this whole thing like it's serious. You know what I mean? Like they had genuine concern for his mental health. And he was just he was just wrestling. He was just living his gimmick. He was living the gimmick. Yeah. We know people who uh wore their titles to strip clubs. You're living your gimmick. Why wouldn't you? If I had a title, I'd wear it under my clothes every day. <laughs> Oh, so Wayne, Wayne, I got to ask you, are there any like, so I haven't seen the second episode, but there, are there any stories that you remember 
about Memphis wrestling that they didn't cover that kind of shows whether whether it was a shoot angle or if it was a worked angle. You're, is there any that like stuck to your head? Like we all had that moment. Like I remember the Piper's Pit and just like me and Gene explaining like how somebody could be so wretched, so horrible can turn into a pro wrestler like this. And I'm like, oh, cool. You can be a wrestler. Like, do you remember any of those stories in Memphis? Like, is there one that sticks out for you? Oh my goodness! I know there's tons. Uh, of course, I covered the one, the, the one at the airport. That was that was very cool. Um, man, my gosh! Well, one thing that that really stands out that was unique to me about Memphis and and other territories did this too, but the feud was usually between Jerry Lawler and whatever manager was on hand, Jimmy Hart, whoever, Jimmy Cornette, whoever. And so they would they would rotate heels through, and Jimmy Hart, as soon as as you know Lawler in the blow off match got rid of the the latest heel, he would get jumped right after he won by the new find. Jimmy Hart had searched the country and yeah. found you know this heel to come in, and it was just they got years. It was it was Lawler versus Jimmy Hart was rotating people representing Jimmy Hart and they got years out of that. Yeah. And it, it was amazing, you know, and Lawler would never get his hands on Jimmy Hart. He would get a, a punch in or maybe two and someone else would jump it. And, you know, and it was just the fans would show up week after week after week thinking this is the week Lawler's going to get his hands on Jimmy Hart. And it, and it didn't happen J much like in mid South. There was a two-year angle between the Rock and Roll Express and the and the Midnight Express, and it never got boring. It was written so well, it never got boring. And today's wrestling, man, they don't have enough patience to get the 30-day cycle pay-per-views in on these angles sometimes. Yeah, yeah and, they don't let And it that marinate. was really, but some of the, the some of the stuff like there's an old story where um, the the fabulous ones. They, they, you know, they were kind of introduced by Jackie Fargo, and Fargo used to do this walking strut where he would, you know, swing his body. A lot of fans know the Fargo strut, the but Fargo. you can look it up easy enough. But anyway, the fabulous ones were endorsed by Jackie Fargo, so they got to do the the Fargo strut, and they were babies, and they ruled. They were, they were almost as big as Lawler, and you can't over overestimate how big Lawler was. Oh yeah. And one night on a house show, no TV camera or nothing, Coco Beware did the Fargo strut in his match. Now, the Heel Fargo Coco strut was Beware. Famous. A lot of wrestlers did it, but at that point in time it was belonged to the fabulous ones. So they used to run split shows. And Lawler and the fabulous ones were going to Indianapolis and Bill Dundee and, you know, some, some more mid-card guys was headed to a, a little town in Mississippi. The fabulous ones no-showed the show in Indianapolis and drove down to the show in Mississippi. And Steve Kern come through the back door, and everybody's like, what are you doing here? And he went straight. He said, where's Coco? And they said, he's in the shower. He went straight back into the shower and sucker-punched. Coco beware over that, <laughs> over that, uh, over a gimmick. strut on a house show. Unreal. And a naked, wet Coco beware beat his ass, <laughs> wore him out. They had to pull Coco beware off of him. And if people don't know, that guy was thick. He was literally the definition of a fire hydrant. Yo, Coco, and you didn't yeah. mess with Coco Beware. Yeah, it's funny. Everyone remembers him as just like the Birdman and bird man. Frankie and how happy and go lucky he was. But I remember seeing him in person, and yeah, he was thicker than a snicker. Like he had this neck that he like he had. No, it was just like so much neck, like you couldn't imagine. <laughs> and to now imagine that he basically had. Uh, the history of violent shower fight with Steve Kern, Skinner, fabulous. That's unreal to think about. <laughs> yeah. Just, Another little funny story. This isn't this isn't as bombastic, but I always thought this was hilarious. Um, Austin Idol 
when he came into town and all the boys got excited when Austin Idol showed up because their pays were, uh, payoffs were going to go up across the territory. That man just could draw. And, but he was notorious for he wanted it super light. He did not want to feel nothing. He, did, he didn't want to be touched. So he liked working Lawler because it wasn't gonna he wasn't gonna feel anything. It was a night off. But and he 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 didn't stay. He he had was done well with his money, so he kind of would come in and out, in and out. He 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 wasn't really a full time wrestler. So he came in and him and Lawler were both babies and they were working up to a a, a, a tag match and Lawler booked himself against Jesse the Body Ventura. Oh man! Who, you couldn't feel a thing. Ventura worked super light, and he put Austin Idol with Dan Hansen. Oh god! <laughs> and Idol threw a fit, and uh, he he went to Stan Hansen. He said, "Man, you know, let's just take it easy. No big deal." They get in the ring. Stan Hansen starts beating the crap out of him. Yeah. So. The idol starts saying something in the ring and's like, "Hey, man, lighten up!" He goes, "Yeah, no problem." Wham! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is Stan the Man Hanson, Stan the Larry and Hanson, who who took out Big Van Vader's eye with a shot. That's how stiff he was. Like, not yes. like, he didn't do the pluck. It was a punch that actually knocked yes. his eyeball out with a punch. That's stiff. <laughs> That's stiff. But, but yeah, and that, that right that to me was wrestling in a nutshell right there. <laughs> that's funny. That story putting a, pulling a rib on Austin Idol, the guy that I, I'll come back, guys, if you give me somebody light, and they suckered him in with Stan Hansen. <laughs> that was just a, yeah, you're asking that. So JJ, uh, you know, he watched a lot of her uh, Wayne. Her, he watched a lot of our stuff that were wrestling in the valley. <laughs> And we talked about that story. I was just a rookie. I had no idea. I was like, oh man, I got a stomach ache. Don't work my stomach. I don't want an accident to happen in the middle of the ring. Oh, sure, no problem. And of course, you just might as well put a target on you at that point. Don't. So whatever you want, don't say it. <laughs> Mario, we're we're in this building, and the heels are sep- are dressing separate from the babies. Yeah. And they're they're you know the crowd, you know the at that time the crowd was buying into everything. K. Fay was alive. And the only way we had to communicate between the two locker rooms was a walkie-talkie. So I'm sitting there, and one of the refs comes and says, hey, man, Jeff wants to talk to you. And I go over there, and I pick up the walkie-talkie, and he says, hey, man, I'm sick in my stomach. I'm really having problems. I don't want to shit all over myself. Please tell Buddy to lay off. And I said, you know, if I go over there and tell him, He's gonna, he's gonna, it's gonna be brutal. I don't think you should point that out. <laughs> and he says, "No, man, buddy's cool. Just tell him, just talk to him. I mean, I'm, I'm being serious, Wayne. I'm really sick." <laughs> and, and I said, "Okay, but I don't know if this is a good idea." And I went up to Buddy and I said, "Hey, buddy, Jeff just sent a message over and asked me to tell you that he's really sick. He really needs you to lay off his gut." And and he goes, "Oh, no problem, Wayne. I, man, I've been there. Don't worry about it." So. The match starts. They tie up. Buddy backs him into a corner. Wham, wham, wham! Right in the gut with punches. Then he starts kicking him in the gut. He pulls him out and gives him a suplex. Opening move. <laughs> and this was, uh, I was working as Jason the 13th, so I couldn't sell like I really wanted to sell how much bubble guts I had going on. <laughs> this is when Wayne had the freaked out moment when, Mike, what's up, brother? Glad you made it in there. We gave the shit. Mike! <laughs> but, Mara, this was the story where <laughs> Wayne, remember, you're like, hey, you're gonna, you leaned over the stall, and I had the hockey mask up on my head, so it basically looked like Jason Voorhees was looking up at you sitting on the toilet, like, hey, you're going to be okay in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the best part... Mario, there was no bathrooms for the wrestlers. Yeah. So Jeff is in the the public bathroom, <laughs> and this older Hispanic guy opened the door. <laughs> Jeff had forgot to latch the door. And so here's Jason sitting on the toilet with with his mask on, and he looks up and goes, "Hey, how's it going?" <laughs> and everyone really did believe that Jason was a demon. And the guy starts saying, Mario, Diablo, Diablo, and runs out of the bathroom. 
<laughs> that's that's key. a that's a movie right there. Yeah, to me. that's Kayfabe. To was me, a, that's a film. <laughs> Kayfabe was alive and well. Y'all even. should write a movie together about wrestling in the Valley. I'll direct <laughs> it for free. We did. We wrote Kayfabe the series, and we actually had a lot of those. Stories. Well, you know, I was telling you the other day that because like, we were talking about. Uh, Tales of the Territories. If someone did a movie about Memphis wrestling in the 70s, 80s, that would be so awesome. Oh, man, it would be. A film, though, not like a documentary, just like a, a straight up film. A straight up, like, sort of fictionalized version of it where they incorporate a lot of these stories and events. Like that one where they're talking on Tales of the Territories about uh, Waffle House and Macho Man getting in a fight at Waffle oh, House. Oh, I know? love that story. <laughs> Why yeah. does so much stuff Can you just imagine you could just have a have a Waffle House fight in a movie? Would that'd be so great? <laughs> Y'all should write that. It was so great that it was just like out of nowhere too. Of just like you deciding like you were taking too long with his food. It's like who cares about your wedding, brother? <laughs> <laughs> and then they're freaking dueling with butter knives <laughs> in a Waffle House. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of stuff happened. You can just call the movie the Waffle House when we we have so many Waffle House stories. Are those pecan waffles? <laughs> your oh. your son is bleeding out. Yeah, but are those pecans in those waffles? 